So we're going to conclude the Gospel Conversation series. This is going to be week six of this series. It's going to be the sixth message, I believe. Yeah, week six. And so we're going to look at John 15, and we're going to conclude this series. And so just to kind of go give an overview of where we have been, we began the series in John chapter 1, where we looked at the incarnation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14 of chapter 1 said that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so that's the incarnation, God becoming man. And this, is the, this, was, the, this was the beginning of the gospel conversation, God becoming one of us, God becoming man, Emmanuel, God with us. And then we looked at John chapter 3, looked at the story of Nicodemus, and Nicodemus was, was a Pharisee. He believed that his righteousness was because of his heritage as a Jew and because of his observance of the law. And so Jesus gave some news to Nicodemus, and he said, Nicodemus, it's not because of who you were born to, what family you were born into, and it's not because you keep the law. Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born again. You have to be born again to be pleasing to the Lord. And then we looked in John chapter 4 at the, the conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And this is, such a, this is such a powerful story of how Jesus broke down cultural barriers and how he had a conversation with a woman, but he had a conversation with a woman that was a Samaritan that the Jews would have had no dealings with. And so Jesus pursues those that are, that are unclean, that don't look like us, don't act like us, but he pursues them because the gospel is for everyone. And he looked, at, he looked at the Samaritan woman, and he told her, he, she, he said to her, go call your husband. Because she was living in adultery. She was living with a man that was not her husband. And so Jesus, Jesus gave us a picture there that salvation and repentance, belief and repentance, go together. And that you must repent and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then, and then so that was kind of the picture of the gospel. And then, and then we looked at a false gospel. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at and unpacked the prosperity gospel and this reality that not all messages that appear to be the gospel, that not all messages about Christ are true gospel messages. And so we looked specifically at the prosperity gospel. We unpacked that reality that the gospel, the primary purpose of the gospel, the primary purpose of scripture is the glory of God, that Christ would be glorified in and through our life. And then last week, Pastor Matt did an amazing job preaching about the response to the gospel. And so that's what we looked at. We talked about how the only true response to extravagant grace is extravagant worship. That God has extravagantly and lavishly poured out his love on us. And any time that, that happens and we receive that extravagant, lavish love, what should the response be? Should it be half-hearted? Well, that's pretty good, God. Thank you for that. I, I Appreciate that lavish, extravagant forgiveness and grace. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll think about worshiping you. No, whenever you understand the depths of your sin, when you understand the depths of the rebellion in your heart against God, you understand that there's nothing you can do to save yourself, and God lavishly and graciously saves you. The only proper response to worship is extravagant worship. And extravagant worship is not just the songs we sing, but extravagant worship is the life that we live. And that's what we talked about last week. Extravagant worship is a lifestyle. Amen? Amen. Now we're going to conclude and we're going to talk about what happens as a result of the gospel. That is our response to the gospel, to worship God with all of our heart. But what takes place in our life when the gospel takes root in our heart? What takes place. So let's look at John 15, one of the most famous sections of Scripture, one of the most famous sections of, 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 of Jesus' communication about who he is. And this is a section where Jesus declares that he is the true vine. He says, I am the true vine. There are seven I am statements that Jesus gives in the Gospel of John. And this is the last I am statement where he declares that he is the true vine. And this is a section where Jesus talks about abiding in him and bearing fruit. And so that's the title of the message this morning, Abiding and Bearing Fruit. So let's look at the text, John 15. Let's read the first eight verses, and we will unpack it here this morning. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. 
Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in, in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Powerful section here. So what we want to unpack, I want to unpack really four thoughts here this morning about this section, about this, this reality that something takes place when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. When we repent and believe, something takes place. And there is a response to the gospel. There is a trans, transformation that takes place, and it is evident in our life. And that's what we're going to unpack in these eight verses. And so the first thing we want to look at this morning is this, is that a fruitless disciple is no disciple at all. A fruitless disciple is no disciple at all. Let's look at the, that, that verse 2 there. It says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that do, does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Jesus is comparing and contrasting between those who appear on the outside to be believers and those that really are. He's saying that there are branches that are connected to me, that are attached to the vine, but they're not bearing fruit, and eventually they're going to be cut off. But there are branches that are connected to the vine, which he says he's the true vine, and they are bearing fruit. And so he says, I prune them so that they will bear more fruit. So this is the clear picture that there are those who appear to be true branches, and then there are those that are actually true branches. And do you know that that's really how it's been throughout the history of the church? There are those who can, they, they, they like to associate with the things of God, like to associate with the things of Christ, like to possibly even name the name of Christ, but they're really not even believers because they're not bearing fruit that is pleasing to the Lord. And then in the midst of all of that, there's always going to be people that are, that are truly connected to the vine, that they, that they are getting the life source of Christ into their spiritual life, and they are bearing fruit. And because they are bearing fruit, the Lord prunes them so that they will bear more fruit. And you know, one of the clearest examples of this is Judas, Judas Iscariot. And when Jesus is giving this this analogy to his disciples. This is John 15. So let's, let's kind of get a picture of where we are here. This is Passion Week. This is hours before Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is right before the disciples head to the Garden of Gethsemane. What happens right before they went to the Garden of Gethsemane? If you go to John 13, two chapters earlier, Jesus is in an upper room. And what we know of, of Jesus being in an upper room, was that they were, up, they were in an upper room because they were hiding. In other portions of the gospel, in John 13, it says that they locked, they, go, they went to an upper room and locked the door because people were seeking Jesus' life to arrest him and to kill him. But Jesus, Jesus wasn't ready yet. He had some business he had to attend to with his disciples. So he's in the upper room, John 13, and, and we see the, the famous section there where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. He demonstrates to, to the disciples what it really looks like to be a leader. And he says to them, if I don't wash you, you have no part in me. And so he washes their feet. And then, and then further on, they, they recline at table after he washes their feet. And they recline at table. And Jesus begins to say, one of you is going to betray me. There's 12 of them. Judas is amongst the 12 sitting at the table with Jesus and says, one of you. Can you imagine that moment? What were the other disciples, what, what, what were the disciples thinking when Jesus said, one of you will betray me? I mean, I would have been at the, the table and been looking like, is it, is it you? Is it you? I wouldn't have been thinking it was me. But can you imagine that moment? One of you will betray me. And, and, then, and then he says, I'm going to give you a big clue. The one that's going to dip the bread in, in the dish with me is the one that's going to betray me. Can you imagine what happened when Judas and Jesus were going for the dish at the same time? Do you think Judas would be like, what, putting that bread back in his pocket? But he... It didn't, right? It was a clear indicator. Judas had dipped his bread in the dish with Jesus at the same time. And then he looked at, G at Judas, turned to Judas and said, Judas, whatever you're going to go do, do it 
quickly. And Judas got up and he walked out the door. Judas was a picture of a false disciple. Do you know Judas walked with Jesus for the entire time? Do you know Judas was one of the original disciples that were sent out in the name of Jesus to do miracles? He bared, he bore the name of Jesus. He went and preached repentance and he did miracles. He was not a true disciple though. This is the picture. And so when Jesus is giving this, when you get to the end of chapter 14, get to the end of John chapter 14, the text says, after Jesus tells them someone will betray them, after he points the spotlight on Judas, after Judas gets up and walks out, can you imagine the moment? Can you imagine that? Jesus looks at the rest of the disciples. You see it in John 14. It says, arise, let's go on from here. And so it's at that point, when we get into John 15, he begins to talk to them about something. So you know that in their minds, they're just, that, that, that was a powerful moment that they experienced where Jesus pointed out that one of the disciples that walked with him for over two years was going to deny him and betray him. And this would have been racing through the minds of the 11 disciples as they walked. And where they were walking, when you start in John 15, you go all the way to John 18, where they were walking to was the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus was going to pray and they were going to fall asleep. So before they get to their nap time, in John 18, Jesus begins to talk to them and tries to give context for them as to what just happened. And he says, back in verse one, what did he say there? I'm the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that's attached to me that does not bear fruit, they're gonna be cut off. But every branch that, that is attached to me that bears fruit, I will prune him so he will bear more fruit. It's a clear picture of those who are true disciples and those who are false. The life of Jesus in this analogy gives us a clear picture that there are and always will be two kinds of branches that are attached to the vine. Those that are alive and fruitful and those that are dead and will be cut off. You get to Matthew 7. Matthew 7, 21, it says that in that day, the day of the Lord, the day of the judgment of the Lord, that there will be many on that day. And when you translate that word many, it literally means majority or most. There will be many on that day who will say, Lord, Lord, we cast out demons in your name. We did many wonders in your name. And Jesus will look at them and say, I, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's Matthew 7, 21. The main point of this word picture is that to be a believer means that you abide in Christ. And since you abide in Christ, you will have fruit that, of that abiding evident in your life. Do you follow what I just said there? To a, be a believer means that you do abide in him. It's not something that you do after you become a believer. Well, I'm going to become a believer and then I'm going to abide. No, no. The picture Jesus is giving here is that believers abide. Believers abide. That's what he's saying here. That if you are a believer, you abide in him and you bear fruit of that abiding. The gospel, when it has taken root in someone's heart, will produce evidence of its power to transform a life. The Bible does not give us a picture of a genuine believer that has no fruit evident in their life of Christ's redemptive work. There's no evidence of that in Scripture. If you are a believer here in Jesus Christ, you will bear fruit. Just like an orange tree. If it is a healthy orange tree connected to the proper nutrients, what's going to happen? The oranges are going to pop out. An apple tree, the apples are going to pop out if it's connected to the right nutrients. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are connected to the vine, to the spiritual nutrients that you need to bear fruit. You will show evidence in your life that you are a believer. But if you profess to be a believer and you say that you're attached to the vine and there's no evidence in your life, then you need to question whether you are, examine yourself to see if you are in the faith. This is a picture that we see. A fruitless disciple is no disciple at all. You guys ever seen, I hope you haven't, I know some of you do watch this show, and, but I just want to warn you, it's not a good show, and I don't watch this show, but how many of you heard in the news about the Bachelorette show that has been going on right now? I don't know where it is in the season, I just read this on a, popular, on, on, on a news feed on uh, CBS News, and the woman who's the bachelorette, right? The idea of the show is you got a woman and then they have the bachelor where you have a man and, and all these, for, this, for the bachelorette, all these men are trying to win over the love of a woman in, I don't know how long it lasts, a few weeks or something, if that's actually possible for two people to fall in love. And, and what we know of the show and what you hear is that there's a lot of infidelity that goes on during that show. And, and so each 
contestant goes on dates with the bachelorette and it, you know, it, it sells and people watch it because of the infidelity that goes on. And so you had one man that was in there. He said he was a Christian. And he looked at the bachelorette and he said, you know, I want to not sleep around on this show because I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And the woman, the bachelorette, said, well, that's offensive to me. You're shaming me. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And, and he looked at her and said, in fact, if you tell me right now that you're going to sleep with other uh, uh, eligible bachelors that are on this show, I want you to know that if you pick me, I'm out. Right? Would that make sense? If you're dating somebody, isn't that common sense? If you're dating somebody, you would want to say, okay, look, we're going to date, but if you're going to cheat on me while we're dating, I'm out. But because he used his Christianity, she got offended, and she said, well, I'm a Christian too, and, and I don't mind sleeping around. And this is what she said, Jesus forgives me. Jesus will forgive me. And so begs the question, can a believer live a life? Can a true, genuine believer say that, that I can just sin and live with that mindset that, yeah, I know I'm going to sin, and, and you know, it's just going to happen, but, but I know Jesus will forgive me. Is that what a true believer does? Genuine believers do not have a flippant response to sin. They don't have a flippant response to sin. And that's, what I, that, that's the picture we see in Scripture. 1 John chapter 1 says this. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk, while the pattern of our life, while we walk in darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, bachelorette, if you say, well, you know, really, that there is no sin. Jesus just forgives it all. It's not a big deal. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But here's, here's what a believer does. A believer, if we confess our sins, if we acknowledge sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. True believers do not have a flippant response to sin like the bachelorette did. I was talking about that subject in a group of men and, and Jared LaFont was in there. And I know Jared LaFont is not here. Is the LaFont family here? Any of, no, I don't think they're here. They couldn't make it because of the storm. But I told him, I said, he, he made this statement, and I jumped out of my seat, and I went and got my computer, and I typed what Jared said, and it's in your handout. It's in your notes. We were talking about this subject. I said, I'm going to quote Jared LaFont in my sermon. Listen to this. If, this is what Jared said. If we're not careful, we can begin to see forgiveness as a right and not as a gift. If we're not careful... We can begin to see forgiveness as a right and not as a gift. Well, I'm entitled to forgiveness. I'm a Christian, and, and I can live how I want, and it's okay because I'm entitled to forgiveness. That's not a genuine response of a believer. You know, there's a mindset that could be out there. Well, you know, I'm saved, but Jesus is not my Lord yet. I'm saved. I'm, I'm, I'm born again, and I have my fire insurance, but, you know, Jesus is not the Lord of my life yet. Uh, and I'm going to eventually get to the point where, where I'm going to give lordship to Christ, and he can be Lord over all these areas in my life. But right now, I'm, yes, I'm a believer, but Jesus is not Lord. And here's what I would tell you. Scripture gives us a picture that if Jesus is not Lord, then you're not born again. He's either Lord of all of your life, or he's not Lord at all in your life. That's the picture of the gospel. We will bear fruit in our life of the power of the gospel transforming us. Matthew 13 shows us this. Hear the parable of the sower. This is the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. That's where it was sown on rocky ground. These are pictures of different types of soil in the heart of man. That's where it was sown on the rocky ground, the rocky heart. This is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet they have no root in himself. Like Judas, there's no root in himself, but it endures for a while. But when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. That's where it was sown among thorns. This is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. 
Now, ah, now as for what was sown on good soil, this is the soil that's prepared by the word of God. This is the one who hears the word and understands it. It's, it's important that for those of you who make a profession of faith, you must understand it. You must understand what you're doing, that whenever you profess Christ, that it is a laying down of all of your life. The seed of the gospel comes and penetrates your heart. You hear it. You understand it. He indeed bears fruit. He indeed bears fruit, and it yields in one case a hundredfold, in another 60, and in another 30. There will be fruit. We're not all going to be at the same spiritual level. In, in one case, it's 100, in another 60, and in another 30, but there will indeed be fruit or a sign of redemption. Amen? Amen. A fruitless disciple is no disciple at all. There will be evidence. Do you remember when you first got saved? What's the initial evidence of when you first get saved? You want to tell everybody. You want to tell everybody. Because why? Because you were lost, but now you're found. It's like the, it's like the prodigal son. He comes. The father pursues him, runs after him. We're, we're the prodigal children. We're, we're pursuing our own lust, our own pleasures, and the father pursues us in his love. And what did the father say? Let's throw a party because my son or my daughter that was lost is found. And so what do you do? You want to tell everyone, like the Samaritan woman, she encountered Christ for who he is, and, and, and she went and told the town where she came from, come and see a man. That's what happens, is that there's this initial evidence of salvation. The second thing we see as we move on here is that the vine dresser cuts off what hinders growth. And so the true vines that are, that are truly connected, the, the true branches that are truly connected to the vine, they will show evidence that they are born again. We're not, but, but we're not altogether what we need to be. Is that not true? We're not what we need to be this side of heaven. God is working on us. He is maturing us. And so here's what we see this next section is that because of the power of the gospel at work in our life, we demonstrate evidence of that salvation work, but then God begins this process of a lifelong pruning. You guys love the pruning of the Lord in your life. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes, most of the time, it's painful as it is with pruning. It's a knife. It cuts. The vine dresser cuts off what hinders growth. John 15, 2 says this, and every branch, these are the true branches, the true believers, that does bear fruit, he prunes. So you know you're a believer. One of the evidences that you're a believer is that the Lord cuts on you. It's an evidence of a genuine believer that the word of God is the knife. The word of God is, sharp, the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. So one of the evidences of a genuine believer is that they submit to the teaching of God's word, and that word is like a knife. It's like a sword that cuts. So if you've been feeling cut on lately, you've been feeling convicted lately, you know that's evidence that the Lord is pruning you, working on you. But why does he do it? that we may bear more fruit. God calls us to maturity in our Christian life. How many of you would like to be more, more mature in the Lord tomorrow than you are right now? Amen? How many of you love babies? You love babies? How many of you want to have more babies? I love babies. My wife said we can't have no more, but I love them. You know what I love about babies? I, just, I love everything about them except for a few things, but I do love a lot about babies. I love, I love a little Lincoln. I mean, he's so precious. He wakes up, and right now, all he says is, ma, 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 ma. When he wants food, it's ma. When he wants to, to, you to hold him, it's ma, mom, mom. Everything's mom, and it's so precious. It's so cute. I love when they first wake up, and they're so cuddly. He's like a little snuggle bug, and I love babies, and I think you should have lots of babies. Amen. There are also things that are not very attractive about babies. Here's a list of them. You ready for the list? They are dependent and demanding. So not only does he say ma, 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 but he says it in a way to let us know when he's really upset. He is demanding. He wants what he wants, and he'll arch that back, and he'll throw the head back. They're dependent and demanding. They are unable to feed themselves. They are unable to stay out of messes. Actually, they are a mess on the move. Lincoln is a mess on the move. Wherever he moves, it's a mess in the making. It's coming. The mess is coming. I promise you. We started putting, we, we took forever. I don't know why. It took us so long to put child locks on the cabinet doors. But we got so tired of following him around. She went, she went on a beta trip with Ellie for like five days. And like it wasn't until a day or so before she came back. I just let it go. 
I just, look, look, I'm tired of stopping it, and I don't have time to get the child locks. I just, I can barely have time to get them dressed and fed. And there was stuff everywhere out of the cabinets, the pots, the pans, all the games in the cabinets, game pieces everywhere. It was a disaster area in the house. It was a mess in the making. They love the center of attention. They're so spoiled rotten. They think they're the center of the universe. They are driven by impulses like hunger, pain, and sleep. They're irritated when they're dirty, even though they're the ones who made the mess. They have no manners and no self-control. No self-control. They have short attention spans, and they have no concern for you. Your babies aren't concerned about you. They're concerned about one person. It's themselves. These are natural things associated with babyhood. But when you see adults with these characteristics, <laughs> something tragic has happened. <laughs> and that's the picture, right? We want to mature. We want to go on from immaturity to maturity. And isn't that what happens in our life sometimes, even as adults, that we want our way? And we're going to put our feet in the ground, and we're going to complain, and we're going to argue, and, and we're not going to serve the interest of others because we want it our way right away. And we show those signs of immaturity in our life, but the vine dresser is going to come, and he's going to cut off what hinders growth. H.A. Ironside, who wrote a book called Act Like Men, he, he says this, some of the most difficult people to live with in the church are those who have grown old in the Lord, but have not grown up. In him. They've grown on in the Lord, old in the Lord, but they have not grown up in him. Every true branch that is abiding in the vine will produce fruit, and it is a natural response to being connected to the vine. But the vine dresser desires that the branches would be even more fruitful, so he must prune. He must cut away what will hinder growth, and sometimes he must cut away what is unnecessary in our life. We don't think it's hindering growth, but it's unnecessary, and it is actually hindering growth. So what are the ways in which the Lord prunes us? Sometimes the pruning in our life looks like discipline. It looks like discipline. Hebrews 12 says this, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So how do you know you're a son or you're a branch abiding in the vine? He chastises you. He disciplines you. This is a pruning, for it is discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate. You're not a true branch. You're illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father the, 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 our father, our faithful vine dresser of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline, that cutting, that pruning, seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. That's what happens. There's areas in all of our life of sin. There's areas of all of, in all of our life where we're showing those signs of being immature in the faith. And one of the evidences that you belong to Christ is that he will tell his father, he, him and his father will work together to prune you. That Our faithful vine dresser, the, our heavenly father will come and lovingly correct and discipline the areas where we need to grow. As we are growing in our relationship with the Lord and as his word is working in our heart, God will expose areas of disobedience and sin that must be cut off if we will be effective in what he's called us to do. How many of you as believers, you felt there's a season in your life where you just feel like, I'm not effective. I'm just really not seeing the results that I thought I would see in my life as a Christian. I just want to challenge you with this idea. Examine your heart. Maybe there's areas in your life that you've not fully surrendered to him. Maybe there's areas of disobedience and sin that you're not willing to let the pruning shears of the Lord cut away in your life. We must allow him to cut. Hebrews 12 goes on to say this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And so that's the, that's the point, is that sometimes the pruning looks like discipline of the Lord, and it's very painful. 
Sometimes the pruning in our life looks like trials. Sometimes the pruning in our life looks like trials. James 1, 2 through 4 says this, Count it all joy, my brothers. Speaking to Christians, when you meet trials of various kinds. Have you, have you guys got, got good at that yet in your Christian life? When you're going through trials? I haven't gotten good at it yet. I don't like trials just as much as you don't like trials. That's a challenging scripture. Sometimes we, we read scriptures and we just take it lightly. Oh, yeah, I'm count it all joy. No, that is hard. When we're going through trials, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. That means any and every kind of trial you can think of, James is saying, be joyful about it. Take heart, be joyful. Why does he say that we should count it all joy? For you know that the testing, the discipline, the pruning of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The Lord must prune us because we're bearing fruit. He says, I'm going to prune you. And God doesn't bring the trials in our life, but trials come in our life. That's what Jesus says. For you can be sure that you will go through tribulations, but be of good cheer. Right? Because I've overcome the world. The trials come in our life. Just like Barry came in our life. The trials come. They're going to keep coming. And God will use those trials in our life as opportunities to cut. Look, and I've experienced Have you ever been, and I think this happens for, for, for all of us, there is nothing like a tropical system, whether it's a storm or a hurricane, that will bring out the worst in people. You get so irritated. I, I remember one time when Estelle and I first got married. I'm going to say this. My, my father-in-law may watch it later. But it's okay, because we've made up since. That was almost 16 years ago. We just got married. We, were you, you were pregnant with Joel? Yeah, so Joel's 13 years old. Um, so this is over 16 years ago. And so Katrina, however long ago it was, Katrina was in the Gulf, and it was a Category 5, and we're looking at it on dial-up internet in our apartment. We're living in an apartment, and so I'm trying to decide whether I'm going to lead my family, my pregnant wife, uh, to evacuate. So my father-in-law calls me. And he says, hey, be in my house. This time, we're going to evacuate. And I said, <clears throat> <laughs> as deep as I could get it. I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. I'll get back with you and see if Estelle and I are, are going to evacuate. So I knew at that moment, of course I'm going to evacuate. It's a Category 5. I've never seen a storm that big in my life. This is scary. I don't want to be here. But I had to at least, <clears throat> you know, stand up as a man. And that was just the beginning of many things to come, right? So we evacuate. We make the 15-hour journey on, on, on Highway 90 to Houston on, on the interstate. It took us forever to get to Houston. And we stayed at Estelle's uncle's house, and we were there with like 20 other people. And it's just, it's just terrible. We're sleeping in a, in a little small room on, on air mattresses, and the air conditioning in there is so cold. We're freezing cold. And then we get back. We've got to make the long journey back. We get home. We get to our house, and all of our stuff is lost. All of our fruit is gone, and my power is still not there. So we get back to my father-in-law's house, because we know we've got to stay there some more. And my father-in-law starts barking orders again. And I just lost it. I'm a believer, but I lost it, and I looked at him, and I said, you know what? This is what I said. Stella's my witness. I said, I have had it up to my eyeballs with you. I said, I have had it up to my eyeballs with you. I said, I am not your deckhand. He was a, a boat captain. I am not your deckhand. I am... I am the husband and the leader of my family, and you can't talk to me like that. And so then he responded and said, okay, you can get out of my house. I said, okay, I will. So I got my pregnant wife, and we got in our little Honda Civic, and we drove all the way back to our house, and Stella's bawling our eyes out as we're going down the road. Ben, Ben, we can't do this. This is a good story, right, because we just went through Barry, right? This is real life. We all need pruning. And I knew all, all along, I'm an idiot, this is bad, why am I doing this? I don't want to go, I'm not going to go sleep in my house, there's no air conditioner. So we come back, we apologize, we make up. But there's nothing like those trials and those moments that sometimes get the worst out of us. I was so rude to my father-in-law, right? I was so disrespectful. It didn't matter whether he was crossing boundaries or not. It, didn't, it did not matter. I was wrong. And this is what happens in trials. That we're in, when we're in the middle of trials, we have tunnel vision. And when life is not going our way, we do things and say things that we would not normally say. And it's in those trials that these things come to the surface of our heart. And the Lord says, see, right there, right there, 
That's where I need to prune. That's where I need to work. God uses the trials in our life to show us that we don't have it all together. So I'm not going to ask you this morning how you handled Barry. That's between you and the Lord and our faithful vine dresser. The pressing of trials and difficulties in our life are working in us to produce a steadfast commitment to what matters most in this life. Warren Wiersbe, the theologian Warren Wiersbe says it best. He says, your heavenly father is never nearer to you than when he is pruning you. Sometimes he cuts away the dead wood that might cause trouble, but often he cuts off the living tissue that is robbing you of spiritual vigor. Pruning does not simply mean spiritual surgery that removes what is bad. It can also mean cutting away the good and the better so that we might enjoy the best. Yes, pruning hurts, but it also helps. We may, we may not enjoy it, but we need it. Amen? Amen. So our faithful vine dresser, he's going to prune us. The third thing we want to look at here this morning is that the true vine supplies the nutrients for growth. We're, the true vine supplies the nutrients for growth. Let's go back to the text, John 15, 5. And so a true branch that is connected to the true vine will produce spiritual fruit. And as he produces, as that person produces spiritual fruit, the faithful vine dresser will come and prune so that we will bear more fruit. But we must never forget this, hear me, we must never forget this truth, that the true vine is the one that supplies the nutrients for growth. It's not us, it's him. It's what Jesus says, John 15, 5, I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We must never forget this. And here's the picture of what's going on here as Jesus is declaring himself as the true vine. Back in verse one, he says, I'm the true vine. He's declaring himself to be the source of true spiritual life. You know, there were other people that were called vines of God. The nation of Israel was declared to be the vine of God, and God was going to use them as, as, as a vine to bring forth the Messiah, to bring forth Christ, but they became a corrupted vine. And you read in Isaiah chapter 5, it says that they didn't produce true spiritual nurture, uh, nutrients. They didn't produce true spiritual fruit because why? They rejected the true vine who was Christ. When Christ came, they were called to be a vine of God that would produce the Messiah. He would come through the nation of Israel, but they rejected him. And so Jesus is standing looking at Jewish men, and he's looking wherever he went, and he was declaring himself to be the true representative of God. And so he says, I am the true vine. What was he saying by saying he was the true vine? He was declaring himself as the true vine. Jesus declaring himself as a true vine was him saying that Israel was no longer going to be the central focus of God's plan for salvation. That focus was now placed squarely on his shoulders as he was about to carry the weight of the wrath of God for the sins of humanity. When Jesus was declaring that he was a true vine, he was saying, look to me. Look to me, I am the true vine. I am the true way to God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true way. I am the true life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Come to me. That's what he was saying when he declared, I'm the true vine. And we must never forget that, that the true vine, when we're connected to him, he's the one that supplies the spiritual nutrients we need for growth. It's not our ability to pull up our bootstraps and to make it happen. I'm just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to force out the fruit. Have you ever seen a fruit tree force out fruit? That doesn't happen, right? Fruit tree doesn't force out fruit. It just, it happens. It comes. The watering of life comes and the rain, the, the rain comes and nutrients soak into the ground and a fruit tree produces fruit and so it is in our life and we're connected to the true vine we're connected to the word of God we're connected to the body of Christ those nutrients come into our life and it is God that is working in us we must never forget that apart from Christ we can do nothing on our own that is pleasing to God we must hear me we must live our lives in a continual dependency on the Lord do you know you're dependent if you don't believe you're dependent, let me tell you this morning, you are dependent on the Lord. You need him. I need God so much. 
in trials of this life, in difficulties of this life, you, we, 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 are, we, are, we are reminded again, and it's healthy to be reminded on a regular basis how much we need the Lord. We must live our lives in continual dependency on Christ. God is the one who produces the fruit of sanctification in our life. Our only response is to say yes. Say yes. Yield. Yield through obedience. Philippians 2 says this, Therefore, my beloved, speaking to Christians, as you have, as you have always obeyed, just say yes, obey. So now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Listen to this. So he says right there, you got to work out your own salvation. You're going to live out your salvation. Work out, live out what Christ has worked in. Christ has worked in, has worked in through the gospel. So you work out, you live out what Christ has worked in. But what does it say there? For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It's God. He's the one that's doing it. It's his strength in you, supplied through his word, through his presence that is working in you for you to live for him. Second Peter 1, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power. Where does the power come from for the fruit in our life? His divine power has granted to us all things that, per that pertain to life and godliness. It's his power. Colossians 1, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ. Where is he at? He's in you. You abide in him. He abides in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Listen to this. For this I toil. So it's called, we're called to obey. This is the obedience. For this I toil. But how am I toiling? I'm struggling with all of his energy that he works mightily and powerfully in me. Do you guys get what I'm trying to say? It's his power. So don't think when you have all this fruit in your life, oh, I did it. I'm pretty cool. When you start seeing that spiritual fruit, you realize, Lord, that was you. There's no good in me. When, I, when I'm walking in patience, when I'm walking in the fruit of the Spirit, it's not, it's not because I did that and I'm something special. It's because the Lord's power is at work in my life. We need to be continually reminded that we should put no confidence in our flesh. Our confidence is in Christ. If anything good happens, it's because of him and for him. I wrote this down here. This is really, I wrote this for myself, so I would be reminded of this ministry. Ministry is a mercy from the Lord. It's a mercy. The fact that any of us get to minister, as we minister to those that are around us, as I minister preaching God's word, it is a mercy from the Lord that he would allow any of us. I was praying before I came out here. I was like, Lord, how is it that you've allowed me to be a pastor to God's people? God, this is your church, and these are your people. They're not my people. You don't belong to me. This is not my church. This is not my building. It's God's. He purchased you with his own precious blood. You have been redeemed and purchased by him. And, and how is it? I said, Lord, how is it that you are allowing me to pastor these people? It's, 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 it's a mercy beyond anything that I deserve. It is a privilege. And so I see it as a mercy. I must always be reminded that I'm desperate for him. We are desperate people who need to be continually reminded of our desperate need for him. We're connected to the vine. We're, we're being pruned and bearing more fruit, and we must always be reminded of that fruit. Anything good that comes from us is because it's him doing it in us. Amen. Amen. Last thing I want to tell you is this. This is not said explicitly in the text, but it's, it's a question that I think we all ask. The, first, the last point I want to make is this, is that this, the seed is in the fruit. The seed is in the fruit. So here's the question. What kind of fruit are we looking for in our lives as believers? What does a fruitful Christian look like? What kind of fruit are we looking for? Galatians 5 tells us, but if you are led by the Spirit, if you're a true branch connected to the true vine, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. So what's, what's the Apostle Paul saying in Galatians here? He's saying, if you want to know 
what it looks like in the life of somebody who is not a believer, not walking in the Spirit. You look at what it looks like for a believer who, who, who also is yielding to his old ways. This is what, this is what it'll look like. Sexual, sexual immorality, impurity, divisions, dissensions. He goes on and on and on. But this is what he said. I, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, the true branches that are connected to the, to the true vine, what is the fruit we're looking for? It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's the nine fruits of the Spirit. If you think about all those nine fruits, this is what I thought about. Think of any area in your life. If you live in these fruits of the Spirit, you're going to demonstrate who Christ is in you. Think about the things you face. If you walked in love instead of hate. If you walked in joy instead of discouragement. If you had a peace in your heart in the middle of the storm. If you were patient instead of impatient. Think of the situations that we face. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These summarize what it looks like in our life when we are living in the Spirit. When the Spirit is controlling our life and our attitude. When the fruit is being demonstrated. So this is what a fruitful Christian looks like. They demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit. But you know what takes place? Pastor Matt said it good last week. That the fruit in our life is not for us. It's so that others would consume the fruit. So let me tell you, let me show you why my last point was that the seed is in the fruit. So I have, a, I have an apple here. So you guys know what's going to take place when I cut this apple. Let me see if I can cut it without hurting myself. So what's in an apple? It's fruit. But what's in there? A little bitty fruit. The seed, the seed is in the fruit. You got three of them right here. Four. The seed is in the fruit. So what are we trying to say here? That the seed of the gospel in your life that others will consume is in the fruit of the reality that you are connected to the true vine. That as a branch, as a believer connected to the true vine, the fruit is produced. And so then the seed of the gospel is evident in the fruit. And so I would want to eat this, but I don't know how awkward that would be for the next few seconds while I do that. But, but when the, those in our life take a bite of the fruit of peace, joy, goodness, kindness, patience, long-suffering, they, 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 they take a bite of that in your life. What's happening? The gospel is being preached. What did we read early in Matthew 13? The gospel is like seed that is planted. So when in your life, when you're, around, when you're around non-believers, they don't know the Lord, and they eat of that goodness, of that kindness, of that patience, of that long-suffering, of that faithfulness, the gospel is being preached. The seed is in the gospel. Amen? The seed is in the fruit. Fruit is designed to have within itself the ability to replicate. The spiritual fruit in our life was designed to be consumed by others. The fruit of Christ's work in our life is the seed that communicates the power of the gospel. Our lives are meant to communicate the truths of the gospel. We must remember that the branches do not eat the fruit. Others do. We're not producing fruit to please ourselves, but to serve others. We should be the kind of people who feed others by our words and our actions. Amen? Proverbs 10, 21 says this, the lips of the righteous feed many. The lips of the righteous feed many. And Jesus said this in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all that are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see that they may see your fruit, that they may see your good works. And when they see it, they consume it, they, they take part in it, they see it, they may give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And how can you, what's the only way you can give glory to the Father in heaven? Is by acknowledging Jesus as Savior and Lord. So when people that don't know Christ see the fruit in your life, the seed is in the fruit. Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand your feet with me this morning? Lord, 
I thank you, God. You are at work in us. You're the faithful vine dresser. That works in us, that prunes us. We're connected to you. So I want to mention a couple of things. I know that there's probably some of you here this, this morning, and, 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 and you're a believer here this morning. And as I was talking about pruning and, and the work of the Lord in your life and trials and how trials and then maybe even discipline in your life, the Lord prunes through those. And maybe that's you. Maybe you are in that season. You feel like you are being pruned right now, and it is painful. Take heart. Be of good cheer. Persevere. Cling to Christ with all of your heart. He's working in you. And the fruit that's going to come because of it is going to be fruit for many people to consume. And they will point to Christ. But if you're here this morning and, and, you, and you recognize that you're not a true branch connected to the true vine, that maybe you've just kind of attached yourself to church, attached yourself to religion, attached yourself to just this idea of Christianity, but you're really not bearing any fruit evident in your life that you belong to him. I love what Gabriel did there in baptism. And we had another brother that was going to be here, but he couldn't make it. And we got two more coming in a couple of weeks. And we got two more coming a couple of weeks after that, that they're going to publicly declare their faith. And that's what we do. And maybe you're not a, you, you're not a believer yet, and you, you've not publicly declared your faith in Jesus Christ through water baptism. And I encourage you that you must publicly declare your faith in Jesus Christ. And so this is what I want to do. I'm going to close in prayer. I'm going to thank God for what he's doing in our church. And I just want to tell you that we're going to start this. This will be what you're going to hear on a regular basis. But there's a prayer room we're going to have right through that door. You can walk around any doors over here and come all around this corner. And there's going to be a room there that's going to say prayer room. it be a little paper on the wall. But if you need prayer about anything that spoke to your heart in this word, or if you want to confess Christ as your Savior and Lord, you want to pray with somebody to be born again, I will personally be back there. I'm going to leave as soon as I'm done praying and go back to that room. And if you want to talk to me or one of the other pastors, we'll be in there to talk to you, pray for you, anything you're going through. The Lord touched your heart in, in this word. We want to pray for her. If you want to confess Christ, we'd like to help you do that. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what it does. It's the seed of your word that penetrates our heart, that transforms us. And Lord, we surrender to it. We surrender to your word, Lord. And those that don't know you, I pray that they would confess you as Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would help all of us in the season that we're in, in in our life to surrender to your pruning, to not grow weary in well-doing, but to surrender everything in our life and to trust you with it. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stay safe. I love you. I'll see you next week.